Good evening, friends, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the uh, book signing event featuring our author, Lainey Feingold, the author of Structured Negotiations, A Winning Alternative to Lawsuits. Thrilled to have you here. I'm Karen Gorgi. I'm the director of the Computer Center for Visually Impaired People at Baruch College, and we're thrilled to have put this event together with the help of a couple of other entities, which we'll introduce very quickly. Uh, like that, we do want to also so much thank the folks from the Baruch College Bookstore who are welcoming us for this. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> and what next? Let's see. I want to make sure that I do thank our staff here at the Computer Center for Visually Impaired People, which is Vern Vergara, Mohamed Rihan, Lisa Saunders, and Roberta Feliz. Did I leave anybody out on staff? And well, I was going to do our volunteers. And our volunteers, who's, all of whose names I don't know, but you are fabulous. Let's give staff and volunteers a huge hand. Thank you very much. We would not have been able to do this without the help of a couple of very important sponsors. And our first sponsor who agreed to help us with this and in, indeed agreed to help with financing of this, which is such a critical thing, um, is the American Foundation for the Blind. And here, all the way from Washington, to say a few words on behalf of AFB, is a gentleman known probably to many of you whom I like to call the policy wonk in chief, but who actually is the director of public policy at the American Foundation for the Blind. I want to introduce for you for a couple of comments is Mr. Mark Reichert. You guys are really kind. So on behalf of Kirk Adams, our new president and CEO, the board of trustees, and really all of the staff at AFB, I can tell you for me, it's a personal honor. Uh, I've been a huge fan of Lainey for years and years and years. Uh, and certainly on you know, all of our behalf, Lainey's been a tremendous champion. AFB and Lainey have a professional relationship going back decades, and uh, it's been wonderful. Um, I bet everybody in this room knows who and what AFB is, but I do want to take a brief moment to mention to you that one of the claims to fame that we have, in addition to having worked with Lainey for a while, is there was a woman by the name of Helen Keller. Maybe, maybe one or two of you might have heard of Helen Keller before. No one ever talks about Helen. She, you know, the, the deaf blind girl at the water pump, you know, uh, that's great. Uh, people don't often think, though, that Helen grew up. Uh, and frankly, when she grew up, uh, she was a, a, a she was a real handful. Uh, she was a real diva, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I'm not kidding. We, there's a history written of AFB and of the blindness field called the Unseen Minority. Uh, it, it's it's about four times the size of Laney's book. So l read Laney's book first, and then read the Unseen Minority. But if you were to read that book, you'd see a lot of stuff in there about the history of AFB and AFB's work with Helen Keller. I'll tell you two anecdotes. Number one. Helen Keller was a huge clothes horse. She was a, an unbelievable clothes horse. They would send Helen and Annie Sullivan across the country to do various presentations, and uh, they would get there a couple of weeks in advance, and then they would write back to AFB headquarters and say, you know what, that spending allowance you gave us for clothing, for wardrobe, it's all gone. We really do actually need a little bit more. I'm not making this up. That's a true story. And then the second thing I'll tell you is uh, Helen, Helen, uh, loved, she loved to, you know, she would do presentations, let's say, for uh, schools for the blind, let's say, and she would absolutely demand that there would be, you know, so many flowers waiting for her in her dressing room in advance. For This is a woman who clearly understood, knew all too well, she knew all too well how good she was, how effective she was, her status and that is one thing that Lainey does not have in common with Helen Keller. Of all the professionals that I know uh, in this field, there are plenty of people who toot their own horn, who are real divas, and some people have really earned the right to be divas. Uh, Lainey's one of those people, but she is not. And so uh, I think in the true spirit 
of Helen Keller's fierce advocacy, a woman who was a uh, social, uh, a, a, an advocate for the, for the downtrodden, for women, for minorities, uh, someone who was truly a progressive. Uh, it's really in that spirit that we are so pleased to be able to honor uh, this evening Lainey Feingold, and thank you so much for having us help with that. Thank you very much, Mark. We really appreciate it. The other sponsor that we're so thrilled to have and who is helping us with all of our live streaming and our, uh, uh, our captioning is Accessibility NYC, New York City. And the director of the Accessibility NYC Meetup, which is also a sponsor of this event, and I would like to introduce him to you to say a few words, is Mr. Thomas Logan. Thomas, could you come in? So hello everyone, and uh, we're very happy to be also contributing to this event. We're, we're a monthly meetup, uh, Accessibility New York City. Uh, our hashtag is A11Y NYC. Uh, we use that on Twitter, on Meetup, um, and we basically seek to each month bring the community together to talk about a range of accessibility topics. We typically meet the first Tuesday of each month, uh, our next meetup will be happening on November 7th, and we're going to be having a uh, technology executive from Comcast talking about resizable text, making sure that text as it's displayed on our digital screens is readable by everyone at, at different font sizes uh, cleanly. So we'll, we'll change up the events quite a bit. Um, so happy to get to work with uh, Baruch College and with the organization here. Uh, thanks to Lainey Feingold for helping our group network here in New York City. We're a big city and we don't all <laughs> get to know each other. And I echo uh, the same words um, as AFB, uh, that Lainey Feingold has been someone that I have learned a lot from in my 15 years in the career of working in accessibility. And I'm very excited um, to hear her talk and to be able to share her presentation um, with those of you all online as well. So thank you to uh, Jolly McPhee from the Internet Society for helping us uh, put the live stream together. Make sure the guide dog doesn't get run over by the uh, suitcase. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, also thank you to Stanley Sakai, who's here today doing the, the live captioning um, for our event. And so that is why all of the words that are being spoken um, in today's event are also being translated visually uh, into text on a screen up here at the front. So uh, appreciate his work as well and appreciate being here and ready for a great event. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, Lainey Feingold has been in the business of disability law for more than 20 years. And before that, I think she was in labor law, so she was always interested in the rights of people. And if you've seen any of the advertising for the book or for this event or anything, um, Lainey has just been fantastic in helping us get access to so many basic basic parts of life. I, uh, I, I have a certain family member who happens to be in this room who, um, when the uh, ATM first came out, said, wow, this is like Monopoly money, man. And, yeah. and um, I was very mad and very jealous because I couldn't access that. Well, I can now. <laughs> and it, Lainey was seriously involved in, in making that happen. She has had so many interesting, interestingly titled awards since this book of hers has come out. Um, the American Bar Association, actually I think it's their law journal, has dubbed her a legal rebel. <laughs> I don't know what it means, maybe she'll tell us. And then she also received a problem solver award from the Dispute Resolution Division of the American Bar Association. Now, you know, lawyers love disputes, right? So, but she got a Problem Solver Award, and she also got awards 
as the California Lawyer of the Year, not once, but twice. Once in 2000, and I think once in what, 2016? <laughs> she wants me to stop talking now. So friends, I am thrilled to give to you Lainey Feingold. <laughs> I don't know how I can follow all that kindness, but I'm gonna try. So thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Karen, who, when I called her and said, do you think we could do a New, a New York City event? She was completely all over it and put this together in a huge way. Mark and the American Foundation for the Blind just really stepped up and supported it. And for those of you who don't know Accessibility New York City, I love the accessibility meetups. I've spoken to the one in Toronto and Chicago and San Francisco, and I'm really glad to be at Accessibility in New York City. Thank you for coming out, and thank you for your interest in structured negotiations. So I wasn't going to start with Helen Keller, but since Mark was telling us she was a clothes horse, which I don't know about that, I do want to say that I quote Helen Keller in my book, and what I quote her on is this. No pessimist ever discovered the secret of the stars or sailed to an uncharted land or opened a new doorway for the human spirit. And I love that quote and I have it in a section of the book called Grounded Optimism because structured negotiation is a way of solving legal problems without lawsuits. It's a way of enforcing legal rights without fighting but instead collaborating. And I really find Helen Keller a role model in the idea that you have to believe, you have to have optimism that what you're doing in collaboration and being kind instead of going the traditional legal route is gonna bear fruit. And after practicing structured negotiation for I'm kind of dating it 22 years now for reasons I'll tell you in a minute. I do. I have optimism that this is a way that legal problems can be solved and especially, especially legal issues about the rights of disabled people and especially, especially, especially the rights of blind people to access information and technology. So I have the book, it's called Structured Negotiation, a Winning Alternative to Lawsuits and it's about how this process can be used in all sorts of uh, different types of legal disputes. It doesn't have to be disability rights, but my story, thanks to Mark and Karen and other people in the room, is a story of disability rights. So I want to share some of how this whole thing got started, some of the people who played a role, some of how we do what we do, and how we convince you know, Bank America, Walmart, CVS, all these companies have worked with people like you, blind individuals, blind organizations like AFB to improve access to websites, mobile apps, ATMs, and they've all done it without lawsuits. So I have optimism like Helen Keller does, and I want to tell you how it started. So it started actually with a blind lawyer in New York City named Steve Mendelson, which some of you probably know. And Steve came to a colleague of mine in 1994 and said, you know, there is not a single ATM in the entire not just New York, not just California where he also lived, not just the United States, but the whole world. There was not a single ATM that blind people could use independently. There was not a single ATM that spoke out loud or allowed independent input. So he came to us, Linda Dardarian, my colleague who I've done a lot of work on with this, who many of you know, and he said, you know, do you think the ADA could help? And the Americans with Disabilities Act was brand new, it was like four years old. And we had a great lawsuit. You know, structured negotiation is not a thing you do because you're kind of scared to go to court or you think you have a bad case. We had a good claim. We could have had a good class action lawsuit. But we thought, you know what? What if we go to court and a judge thinks, really, blind people using an ATM? No way. I mean, this is what happens when you go to court everybody loses control. So we said, we're gonna try to write a letter. And we in fact wrote three letters in 1995 to Bank America, Wells Fargo, and Citibank. And much to our surprise, the lawyers for all those banks said, okay, we'll sit down and talk to you. 
about ATM accessibility. So for the next four years, and I tell a lot of these stories in the book, uh, for the next four years, blind people, primarily in California, because that's where we were based and that was where those banks were based at the time, worked with Bank America, Wells Fargo, and Citibank to develop some of the first talking ATMs in the, not just the United States, but in the whole world. And we were in talking ATM labs and blind people really had input and influence on what those machines were gonna look like. That we were testing, uh, blind people were in the labs, they were looking at mock-ups, we were testing a Wells Fargo talking ATM where the voice was really the guy standing beside me. I said, that sounds really familiar. And he goes, yeah, that's me. I was just practicing, you know? And I think that taught us that this approach, when you can avoid the lawsuit. Now, let me just say, lawsuits are really important and they're especially important in this political climate in which we find ourselves. Lawsuits are under attack from a lot of directions. Lawsuits are critically needed to enforce civil and human rights. So I'm not here to say, don't do a lawsuit, lawsuit's bad. I'm saying in some circumstances where there's an opportunity for cooperation, to me, it's worth the effort to see if you can establish the collaborative space. So don't leave here, and those of you watching on the live stream, don't say, oh, Lainey Feingold never sues, she doesn't like lawsuits. No, lawsuits are really important. They've shown to be so important in the last 10 months. But there's many, many issues where working together is a better tool. One of the things I always say is structured negotiation is a tool in the toolbox. I used to carry around a whole big toolbox to prove this point. <laughs> but now I found this thing, which I'm going to pass around because I know some people are blind, but make sure I get it back. It is a 12-tool pocket monkey, it's called. And you keep it in your wallet, and it literally has 12 tools. It can do 12 things. I still haven't figured out what all they are. I know it can <laughs> open a bottle and do a measurement. And this is not a toy do not give to children, it says on it. So I'm going to pass it around so you guys can see. But I carry this to really emphasize that stru Here you go. You want to see what it looks like? Yeah, you can pass it behind you when you're done. Um, just that this is a tool, and this has been a really effective tool. And the first place it was effective was in ATMs. So by 1999, we had some of the first talking ATMs, and some of our blind clients who were technologically very sophisticated, as I know some of you in this room are, came to us and said, you know, you're doing a great job on ATMs, but there's a new thing. And that new thing is online banking. And this was like 1998. And some people, Roger Peterson, Jerry Coons, other we work with, some of you may know, said, if you can't use this process of structured negotiation to get us access to online banking, we're going to be back to square one and not have control over our finances. So, you know, I think what I'm going to do with that tool so it doesn't distract people, <laughs> I can see that was not a good idea. I'm going to take it back. If you want to play with it, you can come up to the desk afterwards. Here, let me have, as I can, here, forward, yeah, okay. That's hilarious. Sorry, that was a bad, bad idea. That's hilarious. Bad idea. Do not try this at home, those of you on the live stream. Um, so, so we went to Bank of America, and if we had been in a lawsuit, there would have been a million reasons for Bank of America to say no. We're not going to talk about a website. You didn't tell us about that. What is this website thing? There's no law. There's no regulations. But because we were in a relationship with them and they had gotten to know blind people, they said, yeah, okay, there's a new thing, online banking. We want to make that accessible too. And Bank America has really been a leader and a champion in the accessibility space ever since then. In 2000, they became the very first company in the United States to sign an agreement on web accessibility. In later years, we work with them on their mobile app and their mortgage documents. But it all stemmed from the fact that they, the bankers, met blind people. And that is really the key to structure negotiation. And like I always say, you don't have to wait if you're if you work for a company or you're a consultant, you don't have to wait for a lawyer to knock on the door. You've got to bring disabled people into the development process of all technologies and tools and whatever it is you're building because that is why structured negotiation has been successful and that is why you have accessibility 
when it really works in a company, it's when a company gets it and brings people in. So I have another prop. I'm not going to pass this around either, <laughs> but I want you to know it's up here. This is another reason structured negotiation works. This is a stamp. And the stamp says, don't believe the Braille. And this stamp was, it's a real stamp, and it was put on a stamp pad. And someone, who I'll tell you in a minute who, used to stamp red ink on ATM screens in the 90s in Berkeley. Because when the Americans with Disabilities Act passed, the Banking Association, the American Bankers Association, put Braille on every ATM in the United States. Now, there is still Braille there now, along with talking, adding other information. But the bankers, maybe because they thought it was less expensive, well, obviously it was, maybe they thought blind people really could benefit from Braille on an ATM, which those of you who are blind in the room know you can't because the interactive screens of an ATM aren't static. But this stamp was made by Josh Mealy, who some of you know Josh, I'm sure. He's a friend of mine. And he's also an inventor and a physicist. And he gave me this stamp when I finished the book as a present. Aww. And I value it because it really is a lesson of structured negotiation that in this process, because it's more client-driven and people-driven, just like I'm always saying when I do accessibility legal talks, accessibility is about people. So is structured negotiation as compared to traditional legal strategies. So with the ATMs, we were able to show, not tell. You know, if we had been in lawsuits, we would be writing briefs to say what this stamp says. You know, we'd be trying to convince a job, Braille doesn't work, and we'd have an expert, and the banks would have an expert, and they'd try to prove Braille did work, and there'd be all this stuff. In the talking ATM cases, the bankers met the blind people, and they got it. The light bulbs, you could just see them go off, and I have seen that time and time again. I did a... I did a structured negotiation for a woman who uh, is an options trader with Charles Schwab, which is a really complicated thing to do, whether you're sighted or blind, to trade options online. It's very fast. This woman does it with a computer with audio output as well as a braille display. And we had a meeting with her and all the Charles Schwab developers and trainers and business makers. It took 10 minutes for them to see her use the site they wanted to fix that website. First of all, they had never really thought that they were designing for a blind trader. That is a battle, no matter what our role is in this. I mean, if you're in this room, you are a champion of accessibility. You are a person who needs accessibility. That is our challenge, to get decision makers and builders to understand that we are users in a whole variety of contexts. Not just apps, not just websites, but you know, movies and prescription labels and everything we use, the people who are building it have to know that we all have uh, different abilities. Some of us are disabled and have civil rights to this information. So a um, couple other things. Uh, two more props that I want to just tell stories and about. Uh, and I won't hand out. Well, before I do that, because I don't want to forget to read one little thing in the book that I wasn't going to read, but when I saw Tony Candela here, <laughs> who I met many years ago uh, when he was working for the AFB. Uh, so I wrote this book, and the book is not just for lawyers. It took me like five or six years to write because I wanted it to be available to anyone who wanted to read it. So the American Bar Association did publish it and had a great mentor for it. And they sent it out to the East Coast, and some lawyer on the East Coast <laughs> wrote back and said, She's got to start thinking like a regular lawyer. Like, how does she find clients who want to work collaboratively? You know, because in this guy's mind, most people go to a lawyer because they want fighting. And one thing I've learned is that you can really be a strong advocate without the pounding on the table and the being mean and being difficult. And you can still be a strong advocate. And I think that's what this proved. So because of that comment, I went back. I mean, I have been really privileged that I started working on the talking ATMs, like I said, and ever since that happened, the blind community around the country came to me and my colleagues because they wanted to work in this way. It wasn't like I just sat in my office and said, oh, let's work on point of sale devices. Like AFB and Mark and Paul Schrader were really instrumental in getting 12 different national retailers to do 
uh, tactile point of sale devices so blind people wouldn't have to share their pin. We didn't think of that, me and Linda Dardarian in our offices. We heard from the community who came to us. So it was never an issue for me, oh, I need to find blind people who want to be cooperative. Everybody I know, blind or not, would rather not do a lawsuit. You know, most people who need access, they just want access. They want to go to a website. They don't want to do a lawsuit. They don't want to do structured negotiation. They don't even want to call the help desk. They just want to go to the site, get what they need, and do it. But most of the people, and I interviewed many people for this book, said to me, yeah, I would rather work in cooperation. That's how I'd like to work. However, one person said something different, and I am going to read <laughs> one little paragraph of the book about that. Remember, this is a family event. I know, but it was, it's kind of fun. and. Doing the interviews was the most fun part of being, writing the book. So I, I talked about a lot of other people who said, yeah, I always would rather cooperate. It's my nature. It's how I like doing things. Um, but then there was this. Clients who do not come by a collaborative approach naturally can still be strong claimants when the process is explained and they're coached to be effective participants. Tony Candela, who's sitting right here in the front row, was a driving force behind the National Structured Negotiation Initiative that improved retail checkout devices for blind customers at Walmart, CVS, and a dozen other retailers. And then I sort of explain in lay terms what the POS issue is. Back to Tony. As a blind professional, Candela was justifiably angry and frustrated at having his privacy threatened whenever he wanted to use his debit card. Patience and collaboration are not his go-to approaches. <laughs> Quote, I'm just as prone to say sue the bastards, Candela told me when I asked if the structured negotiation attitude came naturally to him. But I know that structured negotiation, this is Tony's words, I know that structured negotiation is a long-term and more constructive approach to bringing people together. I know how successful it's been and then he went on. So um, I did answer the question of that East Coast lawyer by explaining when, you know, when you are a client with a legal claim, if you're a blind person with a legal right, you have a right to choose the kind of lawyer that you want. Same with the companies. You know, I'm always telling companies, if you get a letter from me, or even if you get a lawsuit, you know, there's a lot more lawsuits being filed, as many of you know. You have a choice when you're a company, uh, what kind of lawyer you're going to hire. Do you want to hire someone who wants to fight? Or do you want to hire someone who wants to work things out? So we've been very, uh, it's not really luck, because I've used this process for about 85 cases, and other disability rights lawyers around the country have used it in their own cases. So I don't really think it's luck, but I think it's using, a, it's like Helen Keller said, it's being optimistic that if you follow the path that we lay out, and if you have an attitude of cooperation, the chances are that the people on the other side, even companies like Wells Fargo or Walmart, or companies not known to, you know, for their warm and fuzzy <laughs> selves, if I may say, um, there's still people in those companies who when given a chance to do the right thing, I have found that do the right thing. So a couple other things I want to share, unless Karen tells me I'm totally out of time, am I? No. Okay, I think I got five minutes. Well, don't forget, we started late. Two things. Another prop I have up here, which I'm definitely not passing around, <laughs> because it's too fun, is my fear monster, which is a plastic, like, three-inch high werewolf kind of guy uh, with big claws and, and a growly face and red eyes and all that. So the reason I have that is because in so much of the work that the blind community and I have done together, there has been fear on the other side. And I'll just give you two quick examples. We worked on accessible pedestrian signals with the city of San Francisco. The parking and traffic department was truly afraid that if they had audible signals, a blind person might mishear them, step into the street, and get hit by a car. Well, our clients, of course, thought that was ridiculous because right now, the signals were silent <laughs> at the time. So how could it be worse to have some audible and tactile information coming from the signals? But that's what they felt. Talking prescription labels. We've worked with Walgreens. That's another thing AFB was involved with, and the American Council of the Blind really taking a leadership role in this. We have 
work with Walgreens, CVS, Caremark, and those pharmacy companies were truly afraid. I believe that they were truly afraid. If any of them are listening out there, they can tell <laughs> me if I'm right. They were afraid that if they gave audible information on the labels, that a blind person would mishear, take the wrong prescription, and die. I don't know. And we're like, and so if we had been in a lawsuit, the situation would have been to write to a judge to say, that's not true, blind people need audible information. We would have had to do like a whole history of blind people listening to audible. But we didn't have to do that because we were able to believe that there was this fear and talk through it and have actual relationships between blind people and the companies spur the companies to realize, oh yeah, we're wrong about this. ATM, same thing, they were afraid, oh my God, this is a money thing. We had somebody tell us that we can't have talking ATMs because blind people will be mugged if they get their own money. <laughs> and we're like, you know, you gotta leave that up to blind people to make a decision about their personal safety. But nonetheless, this, these were real beliefs and a traditional legal structure doesn't leave a lot of room to explore those, to make people feel comfortable, et cetera. So the last prop is this, the Harry Potter magic wand. Aww. And someone told me the other day, you need to have a bigger wand for your presentation. <laughs> this thing is only about four inches. Yeah, that but you need, you do. I'm traveling around. I'm not going to, you know. TSA, take that from me. Yeah, TSA might take it, that's right. The reason I have the magic wand is because we did a case with Cinemark on uh, audio description, which is, for those of you who don't know, technology that movie theaters can install to give blind people additional information about visual stuff that's going on in the theater. So we worked with the California Council of the Blind, who was very involved in many of our cases, as well as a mom and a, her daughter named Rio Popper. And Rio really wanted to go to the opening of the Harry Potter movie. I think it was the third one. And we weren't getting anywhere with Cinemark. Even though we had Helen Keller's optimism, or we tried to, we're sticking with it. That's a big part of this process. Stick with it, you know, believe in it. And Helen, Helen Popper, not Helen Keller, Helen Popper, Rio's mother, <laughs> said, called me up and said, do you think you could convince them to install the technology in one theater so Rio could go to the opening? And they did. It was a little ask, it was a little enough ask. They did, it was great, they gave her royal treatment, they had reserved seats and popcorn. And the next day, I said to both the mom and the daughter, who was like nine, I think at the time, can you write an email that I can send to the company? and show your appreciation. Because appreciation, even in these big companies, people want to hear what they're doing right. And I always say when I'm talking about web accessibility or mobile app, you have a whole team, it looks like a mountain, baby steps. I really believe in that, honoring, appreciating what people do, not criticizing for what's not done yet, but appreciating what's done, having a time frame that's doable and sticking with it, but recognizing not everything can get done overnight. So I think the small step thing has really been critical to a lot of these successes. And I think Karen wants me to stop <laughs> presenting, so you guys have plenty of time for questions. I have a lot more stories if no one has any questions, but go ahead and question. Thank you so much, Lainey. <laughs> now we are going to have some time, yo, we are going to have some time for Q&A, and then we are going to have some time for you to consider buying books. These books are, th this lady's book is accessible on Bookshare, but remember, Christmas and Hanukkah are coming. These will make wonderful gifts, you know, for many friends that you have. I did not pay case. her to say that. I did not even know she was going to say that. See? Now, we're going to start our Q&A by having Mr. Mark Reichart, Esquire, ask at least the first, and if he's good, possibly the first and second questions. So Mark, take it away. Well, that's very kind. So uh, once again, a big hand for Lainey Feingold, ladies and gentlemen. I'm practicing my radio voice. Thank you. So I, I don't know about you all, but um, I am often asked when people hear about the kind of accomplishments, Lainey, that you, you've, you've had over the years, you and Linda Dardarian over the years, 
Uh, so, gee, uh, what is this thing? It's the structured negotiation. What exactly is that? Now, you've talked about it a good bit, and you certainly will read about it in the book. Uh, and, and I get the notion of collaboration and, you know, welcoming. I, I think, you know, as a, as a sort of legal process thing, it's obviously common for lawyers often to file lawsuits. And then, you know, the, the lawsuit gets settled out of court uh, for terms. Uh, and that involves, that process of, that settlement process often involves bringing people together, perhaps under duress of the lawsuit, but it brings people together. And uh, that settlement process sometimes results in some really good changes for folks with disabilities. Um, you know, I think uh, one example, the only one that's coming to mind at the moment, but uh, certainly the one that's most known in our community is certainly the Target case uh, against Target.com. Uh, that case ultimately got settled. But just, just take a minute or two and walk all of us through sort of what is the fundamental difference between sort of that standard approach of going to court and, yeah, it's not you know, taking it to trial or taking, having a judge rule, but so many times those cases get settled. What's the difference between that kind of a settlement and the structured negotiation approach to settling a claim or a concern? Okay, that's a good question, and I do have an entire one-hour PowerPoint on that very <laughs> question, which I couldn't do here, but let me just repeat that lawsuits have been very important in many fields, including yep. Disability Access. National Federation of Blind has done amazing work doing lawsuits, the one you mentioned, Target, and so many other. tons of other lawsuits that I have the Digital Accessibility Legal Update. I just did it in Chicago last week, and it is uh, going to be online. So anyone who's really interested in the legal stuff on this part, can, it'll be on my website posted. Um, okay, so the difference, so I just want to say that. The end settlement, a settlement agreement is the goal of a structured negotiation, and we call a structured negotiation successful when we get such an agreement. The actual agreement is really no different than an agreement at the end of a lawsuit. One small difference is when you have an agreement at the end of a lawsuit, if there's a problem, then you can go to a judge to make sure the agreement sticks. In our cases, we don't have a judge. But the truth is, we've never had to go to a judge to make sure the agreement sticks because we have built a relationship. And yes, things go wrong. When you're talking about talking prescription labels at every Walgreens store in America, sure, there's going to be people who go into their store and don't get what we've negotiated. But because we have a relationship, we have been able, I can pick up the phone. And if picking up the phone isn't enough, we've had cases, we've had new structured negotiations or smaller structured negotiation. So the real difference here is wanting to avoid the conflict and expense that is kind of the hallmark to not just litigation but to a traditional demand letter. You know, most people write a demand letter and they say, fix this in 30 days or we're gonna sue you. We start with a letter, but it doesn't sound like that because I'm here to tell you that in almost nothing I've ever done could be all, the accomplishments could not have been accomplished in 30 days. And my experience has been when real people read the letter, that first impression is gonna make a difference. So we try to extend an invitation to negotiate we save a ton of money on experts. That's another big difference. In a litigated case, even that results in settlement, usually what happens, one side hires an expert, the other side hires an expert. The goal is to tear down the other guy's expert. It's very, very expensive and kind of known in the litigation system as a dysfunctional system for bringing in expertise. In structured negotiation, we encourage joint experts. I mean, when we did that first Bank America web case, they didn't really know about web accessibility. We recommended Sean Henry, who's now with the Web Accessibility Initiative, but who was a private consultant. She was the best there was, and you know, one of the top, there's more people in the field now, but one of the very, very top people in the field, we wanted Bank America to have the advantage of a good person. And that has happened time and time again. So the use of experts, the collaborative fields, just the tone, I can't, I mean, I was a traditional lawyer, like Karen said, I started out being a union side labor lawyer, then I did traditional civil rights, and it's just a very different tone and skill set to decide you're gonna work with someone or with a big company and communicate directly with them. 
It's just a very different feel. And yes, you can accomplish great things in lawsuits, but this is a way you can accomplish them with less stress, conflict, and money spent. That's an excellent. Appreciate Thank that. You. And the second question I'll ask you, exercising my prerogative as sponsor. Ha, ha, ha. You all are a captive audience. But I think this is an important question. How, how do you and Linda, and how do folks who, who do structured negotiation, are there others in the country that are doing this, following in your footsteps, by the way? I snuck an extra question in there. Are, are there yes, others? Yes, in Chicago, there's a lawyer named Andres Gallegos, and we presented together. Oh, good. Uh, he does a lot of really important work with hospitals. He did, uh, he does, mostly represents wheelchair riders. Yeah. He did things like lens crafters, the whole chain to make gotcha. sure that if you're in a wheelchair, you can get your eyes Well, that's great. So people are following in your good work. So yeah. how, how do lawyers who engage in structured negotiation make a decision about whether a matter that comes to your attention, as you say, you, you, you look, you're, 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 you're our friend, we know you, so let's say our community goes to you and says, this thing is really irritating us. How, how do lawyers decide, you know what, maybe the thing you guys are asking us about, maybe this thing isn't right for structured negotiation. How, what are some of the criteria you all go through uh, to sort of decide, yes, yeah, structured negotiation is an appropriate approach, or no, it might not necessarily be the best approach? Well, one good thing about structured negotiation, you can try it, and if it doesn't work, you can file a lawsuit. So you're not really losing anything unless, you know, in law there's a thing you have to file your lawsuit by a certain time. So that would be one thing. If someone comes to you, you know, a month before the time is going to run out, there might not be time to figure out if structured negotiation would be a good strategy, and you'd have to say, you know, you need a lawsuit. There's other kinds of things, like if, if it was an employment type of case, and you were trying to get damages for a nationwide class, like get money for everybody, probably millions and millions of cash dollars to people, companies would not be willing to turn over without more of a litigated environment. But one of the things I've learned, partly in talking about this book over the past year and, and giving a lot of talks, is that you can combine structured negotiation with other strategies. So you can, you know, like, you can start in structured negotiation, and if you get stuck and can't do the money piece, then you can go to a mediator. Or I know Linda's done wonderful work, Linda Dardari and my colleague, with Sutter and Kaiser Hospital Chains in uh, California, where you can, dis I mean, one of the things about this is you can co-create with the, who would otherwise be a defendant, and you could say, you know, maybe this issue is better in court. You can kind of both decide because the company might want protection against other people suing. There's a lot of factors like that. So it's really a question of being open, both the lawyer and the client being open that there are many tools in the toolbox. And so it's hard to predict in one given case, this would work, this wouldn't, but just not to automatically go for the hammer. And that's one of the messages. When everything, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When all, I mean, yeah, that's a good. yeah. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you think a lawsuit is the only way to go, you're going to do a lawsuit. But if you realize, and lawyers shouldn't be deciding on their own. They should be deciding with the clients because there's various factors for different processes. There's also government agency complaints. You know, in the past administration, the U.S. Department of Justice was a real hero of ours in terms of accessibility. Of course, they aren't now, but <laughs> that's not, you know, hopefully that won't be forever. But there's, you know, state agencies, and there's lots of different strategies available to enforce, to enforce our rights. Karen, back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Lainey. That was a fabulous interchange, actually. So now, friends, we're going to go to audience Q&A, and be, especially because we're streaming and the interpreters have to survive also. <laughs> Thank you, interpreters. Um, this is what I like to do. What we'll do is if you have a question, raise your hand. Lainey will pick somebody. And we have volunteers with mics. Are you guys ready with mics? Okay, and, and, and then, um, so Lainey will call on someone. Our colleague Roberta will bring a mic to you. Please say your name and ask a concise question. Okay? So let's rock and roll. We ready? Raise those hands. Lainey's going to pick somebody? Yes, she's going to pick somebody. Oh, well, go ahead. 
You guys can just. It doesn't matter. Tony, you'll be next. Thank you, Lainey, for coming. My name is Alan Gunsberg. My question is about HR 620 and uh, all the moves by the current Congress to, to, to abridge the rights of everyone, including the disabled. Uh, how will this affect uh, structured negotiations and even lawsuits going forward? Yeah, HR 620, the question is about HR 620, which is a very dangerous law currently in Congress that is misnamed the ADA Education Act, but really what it is is a way to limit people's rights under the ADA. It requires that, no, it says nobody can sue unless there's notice, which on its face sounds like, well, what's so bad about that? I mean, you know, like people always say to me, don't you like that because you don't even ever file a lawsuit. No, I'm very opposed to HR 620, as are all disability rights organizations. The primary reason being, this law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is 27 years old. And if all of a sudden, Congress now puts in a notice requirement, and it's an onerous one at that, really, you know, burdensome of how you have to write the letter, and you can't have a lawyer help you if that you want that lawyer to be paid, all that. But at the core, any notice requirement, any notice requirement means no one's going to do anything until the person comes. And what if the person comes, like just a really easy example, New York City, people are here on vacation. They come on vacation, they can't give notice, they don't know what problem they're going to have. The ADA was supposed to fix things by 27 years out, things were supposed to be fixed by now. So, you know, the, it's terrible to take away the rights right now. There are not, um, I don't believe websites are part of it now, but there's a real push by industry to get websites to be part of it, which would really be not good for the accessibility effort. Now, I just want to say, because I want people to freak out, we have a strong foundation for accessibility law with other laws, but the ADA is really at risk, just like so many other things are at risk in this administration. So if you haven't talked to your congressperson or sent a letter or you know, educate yourself about this to know that it's coming and be aware. A good place to get information is from the Disability Rights Education Defense Fund website. It's DREDF.org, and they post action items and, yeah. So thanks for mentioning that. I know, you know, it's weird. I have this book about optimism, and I'm talking about it in the year. The very first talk I did was in Boston with Paul Paravano, who's a blind guy who works at MIT, and he arranged it. We spoke at Harvard Law School. It was five days after the election. I almost wanted to cancel. I mean, my whole thing is about collaboration and getting along with people and being optimistic. And I'm kind of on parallel tracks here for the past year because I still deeply believe that there are so many opportunities to collaborate and cooperate. At the same time, we have to be paying attention to the things that are not negotiable, like HR 620 or the Muslim ban or a million other things that are happening. So I think we can hold both of those ideas. And that's what I had to do that seven days after the, it was really hard to do that talk. Um, but yeah, that's what we have to do. We have to cooperate when we can. We have to model something different. And we have to be aware and protect our rights. Thank you. Actually, Alan asked the question I was going to, to ask. Um, but just to add to it, there is a, an awful lot of deregulation and an awful lot of changing of regulations going on right now, especially at the federal level, that, that will do some of the same things. They would eliminate the right to sue or other actions that could be taken sooner than later. And um, you know, we have a feeling that um, uh, New York foul-mouthed Tony aside, um, we have a feeling that uh, structured negotiation de depends on the, the threat of lawsuit uh, to some extent. And uh, so all these things that happen that take away the, the ability to go to a suit, to some extent might weaken structured negotiation too. And Lainey and I have talked about it. Also, before I give up the mic, you got another award. When I was working with Mark at AFB, we gave you uh, and Linda an access award. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And that was a good that was a good 13, 14 years ago. And Lin and uh, Linda and Laney, you've done a fantastic job. Next Thank question. You. Thank you. Next question. Um, with structured negotiation, um, how do you guys get paid? Because in a lawsuit, usually the ABA, you know, uh, pays the lawyers. Piece. So how do you guys get paid? That is a good question. And when I speak to lawyers, that's usually the first question I get. How the hell do you guys get paid? So as the, you didn't say your name. Alice. As Alice mentioned, under the ADA, in, in the United States, people usually have to pay their own lawyers. But under the ADA and other civil rights laws, race, gender, we have what we call fee shifting. And Congress decided back in the day that disabled people, women, minorities, if they have a legal claim, their lawyers should be paid by the person who's discriminating. So that's when there's a, like in the Target lawsuit that Mark mentioned, Target had to pay. So we don't have a lawsuit. How do we do it? Well, when we write to the companies, we say, if it's an ADA case, you have violated the ADA, we have three remedies. There is the fix. Well, under the ADA, there's the the disabled person who has a civil rights claim has a right to get their attorneys paid and a right to the fix. Under several state laws, including New York, there's also a right to get damages for yourself. So those are the three core types of relief. They call it relief. The three core types of results you can get in an ADA lawsuit. The fix, the talking ATM, the attorneys being paid, and the damages. Well, structured negotiation does not compromise any piece of that. So when we start with the companies, we have a ground rules document, and we have to say in there, at the end of the day, if these negotiations are successful, paying the attorneys, i.e. me, will be one of the elements. And in regular life, there's a lot of fighting about attorney's fees. In structured negotiation, I am really happy to say that in the vast, vast, vast 98% of the cases, we don't really have a problem because by the end of the day, they know us. As I've said, the fees are less because the fees in this kind of law work by the hour. It's not like you know, when you have an accident case, your lawyer takes a percentage. This is how much time did we spend? And that's how I've, you know, there's a lot of skepticism in the legal profession when I talk to lawyer audience. They're like, well, what if, what if, what if? And I, all I can say is this is what happened. I d have gotten paid. This is the only way I've worked for the last 22 years. Um, so yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, Thomas. Wait, you need the mic. Um, it's from Accessibility New York. Um, your website is a great resource for actually being able to go back and review your past settlement agreements. You know, that's been a resource for me of like looking at the language and types of things to explain to other companies, hey, this is what you should be thinking about. Um, have you always had that be sort of like an open source available information and, and have some of the companies you'd worked with not wanted any of the settlement language on your site? Yeah, that's a good question. And for those of you who haven't been to my site, it's lflegal.com. And there's a little usability story there. Also, from Josh Mealy of The Stamp, when I got the website in 2008, I was going to call it laneyfeingold.com. And Josh said, that's ridiculous. No one can spell Laney. No one can spell Feingold. And you need a name that fits on one line of Braille. So <laughs> I took up the LF legal and it was like before Twitter and now I kind of have a brand. Now I think of myself as LF legal. So yeah, you can go on the website lflegal.com and you can read all the agreements. There's a topics page where you can look up press releases by subject. You can see all the web accessibility press releases, ATM. We have really pushed hard to make the agreements public. Early on, it was to establish our credibility of this effort and the cases and to be transparent because how could we, well, we didn't do a lawsuit and we made some sort of agreement, but you can't see what it is. And we convinced the companies that the community really had a right to know, especially we're representing the ACB and the AFB and the CCB, their membership organizations and their nonprofits. So we really, really pushed. I think out of the 85 cases, there have been two or three companies who just said, this is a deal breaker. We do not public, we do not publicize settlement agreements. 
But in those cases, we did get press releases. But we always, we never have settled. You know, occasionally I do one thing for one person on one issue. That's different. But for these types of things where we're fixing companies, fixing websites, it's always either been the agreements public or, um, or the press releases are public. And I'm a big believer that companies should let the community what they're doing as kind of a protection against future legal claims. Now, it doesn't always work. There's some people who will file a lawsuit no matter what. But I will say that there are some people who have filed lawsuits against some of the companies. And when told that there was a structured negotiation agreement, they dropped the case. So we always encourage companies, you know, if you happen to get a lawsuit, call us. We'll, you know, because I kind of feel like our names are on. Like when I see an ATM, I feel my name is on it. Like I'm responsible for it, even though these cases are now like 17 years old. So. Yeah, good question. Next question. Okay, we've got a lot of questions. What's our time? I'll move people along. I'm going to do it till uh, 7.30 because then oh, we want some time for people to um, buy books and... And, and eat cupcakes. It's amazing yeah. looking uh, brownies, cupcakes. Right, so we have, uh, I think we, I have a, like, we have another, like, say, eight or ten minutes. Okay, let, let's go. Keep them concise if you can, folks. We'll try. Eileen, you said Lucia. Um, I have a question. The um, Walgreens downtown and in Midtown would not buy the talking bottles. I like to know what to do. Also, there's going to be a new glucose meter in a couple of months by Abbott Labs called the Freestyle Libra, where you don't have to prick your fingers anymore. You could use laser. And I think that would be great. And I'd like to know it's not going to be speaking, at least not that I know of. What do we do to make it speak? Okay, two good questions. First of all, when people, if like I said, when you're dealing with big companies, there's bound to be issues. So people can always contact me through my website, by email, preferred. Um, I can give out my email now if you want. You can find it through the website, lflegal.com, or my email is lf at lflegal.com, going with the branding thing. Um, so you can always find me and report on a particular store with a problem that I've always worked, already worked on, and I'll, I'll try to get it fixed. As for new issues, if people have new issues, um, what I suggest, email is really the best way to let me know about issues. One thing I should say is these cases, like so occasionally people will call me and say, well, can you fix this? But all the cases <laughs> require advocates. You can't be a person to call me and say, will you fix this, and then don't want to participate yourself. Now, you could be a person who says, I have 10 friends with the same problem. They'll fix it, and then you don't have to. But all of these cases are a partnership, like I started. Structured negotiation is a client-centered, person-centered approach. So it's not, some people, I think, think I'm on the payroll of like AFB or ACB, and they say, put this on the list. Can you get this fixed next month? I'm like, well. It kind of sounds simple now that I, you know, when I talk about the cases, but honestly, you've got to write the letter. It's a lot of research. You've got to spend a lot of time convincing the company to engage. It is a real structure, which is why we named it Structured Negotiation. So um, I'm always happy to hear about issues that are important to the blind community. Can never guarantee that it's something I can help with, but always happy to hear about it. Over here. Over here. Hi, my name is Svetlana, and I am an accessibility consultant. You know, I've heard a lot of great things about your work, and I like, you know, your perspective on negotiation rather than lawsuits. I'm wondering if you are working with uh, different people with disabilities, not only the blind community, or if you specialize in the blind community. Because I know you were talking about your experience with Bank of America <laughs> and the talking ATM, which is great. Um, but I'm wondering, what about deafblind people? How are they going to use the ATM? And also related to you know website accessibility as well. With the Bank of America website, it's not accessible to uh, deaf people because they you know use Bank of America in Europe, and their credit card was blocked. And the Bank of America website used to have uh, an internet chat feature, but now they don't have that anymore. 
So now people are stuck and they have no way to contact the bank, and Bank of America said you have to call, but you can't make calls as a deaf person from Euro Europe. So they prefer some type of direct communication like email or the internet chat. So I'm just wondering if you, know, if you also work with other people with different disabilities other than blindness. Yeah, that's a good question. In fact, many people often ask me this. Not for any like particular reason, it's just it's so, I have worked only with blind people because that is my expertise. And there's a lot of great disability rights lawyers doing work with the deaf community. For issues with Bank America, like you explained, I'd be happy to hear about it. And because I know the banks, there were a lot of uh, cases and negotiations around the relay service issue about five or six years ago. I don't know much about calling from Europe and whether they have accessible communication, whether they have text-based communication. But with companies that I have close relationships with, I'm happy to try to put you in touch with the right person. And I'm not ruling out, if I worked on a, if I personally worked on an issue uh, for deaf people, I would definitely want to work with other lawyers with expertise because, I mean, as you guys know who are blind in the room and as you know who are deaf, there's so many details if you want to do this right. You can't just come in and say, well, I'm a lawyer, I know the law. This is a different kind of legal practice where I think the better lawyers, and I'm really encouraging people now, you know, there's more lawyers in the field if you have an issue vet your lawyer and make sure they really understand. So I'm happy for you to email me offline and tell me about the Bank America situation. Hi, I'm Sylvia. Um, I am working on a, an accessibility initiative at work. I work at a company that makes mobile um, products. And I'm wondering, when you were saying that Bank of America was working with blind Bank or blind customers, how did they go about making those relationships and finding those users? Um, besides, you know, maybe coming out to meetups like this, I'm trying to, if anyone wants to speak with me, I'm kind of open over here. But getting, I just want your insight on how to create those relationships and what are, what's kind of like the etiquette in terms of, you know, having people voice their opinions. Yeah, that's a really good question. Now, my experience being a lawyer in structured negotiation, I can help facilitate those relationships with people who are clients. But for companies, I know there's a lot of work, and I don't know, Alan, others might know, Thomas, um, in terms of having disabled people in for usability testing. I don't know if CCVIP, if you guys do that. We do. Yes, yes, you do? We do. Yeah, so nonprofit organizations like CCVIP, the Computer Center for Visually Impaired People that's sponsoring this. I don't, I have a list, I have a list, I have a resource page on my website that has some nonprofits that do this work. I mean, one thing to know, people are doing this work, you have to expect to pay. It's not like it used to be where you could just call a lighthouse for the blind and get some blind people to volunteer. You'll get better results. And it's only fair that people pay. And you can ask around. There's, you know, st certain standards for oh, if you come in for $75 or whatever. Or, I mean, not 75 but if you come in, what's a reasonable payment for half an hour or an hour? But on my website, in the resource tab, I have nonprofits around the country that do this work. Some of it you can do remotely, like the Carroll Center in, in Newton. They do remote testing. Um, so... Afterwards, some of the meetup people might have ideas for New York City, but yeah, it's really good you're thinking about that because I would just say like one hour with a blind person or a deaf person or someone with mobility issues that can't, you know, or low vision. I mean, I usually focus on blindness because that's been my work, but the accessibility f issues from mobile are cross disability, you know. Like, and, and seniors too, like my dad's 85, he's really active and working, and the other day he put something on Facebook, I'm like, Dad, you gotta give me your password. You don't really get how this works. And you know, he's like a big guy, he's like 6'2", and he's got big hands, and I can see that he's got some issues with button sizing and color contrast. He did give me his password, so. <laughs> I can make sure nothing untoward happens. But yeah. Thank you everybody very, very much. Thank you.
I mean, sitting here. Okay, I mean, I know there are more questions, more questions and I'm going to be called a, a bad name, but I think we really need to give people, the bookstore closes at 8, sharp, everybody, so I'm going to have to call a halt at 7.55. Now, Lady will be at this table, and she will be happy to sign your book once you've bought it, and also, if you have a question, perhaps she'll be happy to... Um, consider your question. So for anybody who, the book uh, book is available at the counter in the bookstore, and we have volunteers who are will be happy to help you get there if you don't actually know where that is. So you can just, you know, sort of uh, raise your hand and let people know that you'd like to do that. And but you I can also come up and see all the props if you didn't get to also, see them. You see, so you have an awful lot to do also <laughs> to eat a cupcake between now <laughs> right. and five minutes to eight. So let's do it. Thank you.